finally notoriously missing in the mainline churches. And that is the essence of authentic discipleship. Uh, either I'm a loving man or I'm nothing. I'm absolutely bankrupt spiritually. Sincerity, value your journey, and or I dismiss you as lightweight Christians. Spiritually rich. goes without a lot of notice. Uh, it's a heart that is filled with love for Jesus and for other people. Jesus said, essentially, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Christian life becomes a charade. It's bankrupt. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've heard a lot about love in the scriptures that we've read today. We had a letter from John. We had a letter from Paul. Uh, We also, or, or a scripture from Paul. We also had... Uh, Jesus himself talking about love in the Sermon on the Mount. And most, pe- most of us know Jesus talked a lot about love. Love God, love your neighbor. And we could probably agree with most people in the world that love is important. We ought to be more loving is the message of a lot of sermons. If you read inspirational Christian writers or you listen to popular preachers, you hear about love, 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 radical love, sacrificial love, self-giving love self-negating, pouring out yourself in love. You hear that love takes work. We don't love enough. We should love more. And when I finally close the book and leave the sermon, I feel that what I've really retained is that love is exhausting. I mean, I'm worn out. Love wipes me out. I'm supposed to pray harder, love God more, and I'm sorry, I just can't. I can't gin up enough love, you know? I mean, I've not enough love in this cast iron heart of mine. Barely enough for the people I really do love, for my, only fa- for my family and friends. How the heck am I supposed to accumulate the psychological energy to love people who annoy the hell out of me? Right? How am I supposed to love Judge Roy Moore? Or terrorists 
of the so-called Islamic State. How am I supposed to love Auburn fans? I'm teasing. Like I care. <laughs> I mean, but sir, how, how am I supposed to gin up this love? Love is exhausting, especially when we hear all this, you ought to love and you should love. And I, I mean, we're all very conscious that we don't love enough. We're not loving as loving as we should be. Because you're very aware of all the people that really tick you off. Right? I mean, I'm, I, you're aware. I probably, you probably have a list. You have a list of people that bother you? I, I'm not serious. I don't actually have a list. Not one that I've written down anyway. But, you know, you, you have this. We have this struggle. Love is hard. And talking about love often just makes us feel inadequate. Be perfect in love? Perfect? Really? Like God sending his son on the wicked and the just and his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous? Like, I can do that? I just don't have it in me. I'm sorry. I confess my unworthiness. But what I find fascinating in this section on love in the Sermon on the Mount is how ridiculously low Jesus sets the bar. I mean, did you notice this? Jesus sets the bar really low here. I mean, he's just finished saying, now this is the hard part, he's just finished saying, if someone asks you to go one mile, go two. If someone hits you on one cheek, turn the other. If someone sues you to take your coat, give them the shirt off your back. He's just finished saying that stuff. So when he ta starts talking about being perfect in love, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be able to deal with this. I'm not going to be able to handle it. It's going to be too much. I can't actually do it. You know, it's going to be one of these, give everything you have away, and, and, and it's going to be too much. I can't do it. And what does he say? If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Did you hear this discrepancy? We've gone from going the second mile and giving someone the shirt off your back to... Saying hello? Do you hear this? Jesus just said, look, say hello. Greet people in the marketplace. Be nice to people. It's not really even love he's talking about here. He's talking about being civil. That suddenly becomes doable, doesn't it? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not bringing down this love ethic down to saying just we got to do the bare minimum. But, but suddenly what seems impossible has just come down into the realm of the doable because I can't always be loving, I'll be honest with you, but I can do civil. And that can be a real work, just being civil. It takes effort to look someone in the eye who you know hates you and you know you would prefer not to see them today. I mean, one of the things that happens, I mean, you, know, you become, I became a pastor because, you know, partially pastors do this because we want people to like us, right? And, you know, we, we're people pleasers. We like to try, you know, and so, but there are some things you have to do in pastoral ministry that are really hard. And I've made my share of enemies, okay? And there are people in the world who I have a really hard time looking in the eye because I have, I have enemies and they do not like me. And saying hello and being civil to them is really hard. But I can do civil. I can show respect. I can make eye contact. I can shake a hand and wave. I can refrain from scowling. Sometimes my smile might be like this. But I can smile. Jesus says, anyone can smile at their friends. It takes strength of character and a determination just to greet people. So I love this about Jesus because he's given us some really high things to aspire to, but then he sets the bar really low. Can you be civil? This is doable stuff. Just be civil. Just be civil. Now, not to make light of this, as I said, it can be really tough. Because there are people I don't want to see, and they don't want to see me. And the fact is, anyone can be nice to people who are nice to them. I'm sure Adolf Hitler loved his mama, right? And that's what Jesus says here. Even tax collectors, even Gentiles, the people, you know, we kind of disparage. These people, these people that are your enemies, they can be nice to people who love them. 
So what credit is it for you? It's not virtuous to love people who love you back. But I think Jesus has touched on something important here because real love doesn't begin with grand heroic actions. It doesn't begin with laying down my life for others or giving someone the shirt off my back. It begins with small expressions of respect and civility. Now, we've been talking about this for the last five weeks. We've talked about John Gottman's research, relationships, that kind of stuff. Gottman talks about uh, a couple in his book, Seven Principles, uh, Seven Principles of Making Marriage Work. And he just tells this story about a a man and a wife. The husband was a doctor. He had a very demanding job, and he wasn't paying much attention to his family. And he was surly. He had gotten to a place where he was under a lot of stress. He was surly. He would snap at them. They would get into arguments. And his wife decided one day that they would just do something really nice for him. They would put together a picnic and go surprise him at his office and at, at lunch when they knew... She knew he had a lunch break, and they would show up and just be nice to him. She was going to make an effort to reach out to him. And when she and her kids came there, they brought the picnic lunch, and when he came into the break room, he was furious at them. He was angry at them for interrupting his day, and he started fussing at them. And and she began to feel really bad, and she began to cry. And then the phone rang. He had a phone call. And when he picked up the phone, he was the most pleasant person. Hello? Hello? And she just about lost it. She said, you were civil to this stranger and you aren't civil to your own family. Because he had just showed that when he wanted to, he could be respectful and grateful. He just wasn't that way at home. So when Gottman got them onto the couch he, he, and, and had them discuss their problems, he, uh, this was one of those situations where You know, Gottman can predict with 95% certainty that people, or 90% certainty whether people will stay together or get a divorce based on how they talk on the sofa. And uh, he was really iffy on this couple. But it was a process of learning how to show respect to each other that actually brought them back into a loving relationship, saved their marriage. So as we've been going through this relationship series, I've been talking about how the things we learn from this research apply not just to couples, but to all relationships. These words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount are one of the reasons that I believe this so strongly. I think if we put this stuff into practice, not only would our personal relationships improve, not only the people in our lives, but we would be an amazing witness to the wider world. Jesus says in John 13, Chapter 13, verse 35, the world will know we are are his disciples by our love. That's how people will know we're Christians. So if we're going to be Jesus' disciples, we have to do these things. Now, these are the sermons that I've been talking about over the last five weeks. If you've missed something, you can always go back and watch the video, okay? So if we're going to be known for our love, if we're going to be disciples who people look at us and say, wow, those people follow Jesus, these are the things we have to do. We have to become emotionally intelligent, Emotional intelligence is is sort of a buzzword right now, but really it means being able to identify what's going on in us and then relate it to the outer world. We have to be able to recognize when our lizard brain is kicking in and dominating our reactions, when we're having that fight-or-flight response, when our heart rate gets elevated, our breathing gets tense, we're in a stressful situation, and we're having a hard time relating to the other person. Once your heart rate gets above 120 beats per minute, you are no longer capable of making good decisions. That's when you're arguing and yelling at each other, okay? So we have to become emotionally intelligent and recognize when we've got to take a break. We also have to be able to recognize these four horsemen, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling. Just to review, criticism, I'm sorry, criticism is when you, um, you're not offering a complaint, you are criticizing someone's character, you're lazy, there's a problem, there's a fundamental problem with you as a human being. Contempt, that's when you sneer, eye rolls, the sarcastic humor, the cutting words. Defensiveness, when someone brings you a complaint, you, know, you just turn it around on them. Now we're just verbal fisticuffs. Stonewalling, eventually it becomes too much and you figure it's just better to ignore the problem or ignore the person. So we have to become emotionally intelligent. We have to admit when we're afraid. We fail to ask, why am I reacting this way? What is making me angry or afraid? What, what is it about this situation that causes me anxiety? What part of my fragile ego has been hurt? 
Now, if we can slow down and apply biblical wisdom to our lives, we can put some of this other stuff into action. But until we learn to use the higher part of our brains, we're just reacting. So that's where these four horsemen come from. The other thing that we have to learn is the difference between contempt and criticism. I mean, sorry, actually, I, I, missed, I did that wrong. should be complaint and criticism. Complaint is a good thing. Couples that complain together, that complain to each other, stay together. The higher incidence of complaining, the better the relationship that the couple had. Criticism, on the other hand, predicted divorce, predicted people separating. The difference between complaint and a criticism, a complaint is about a specific behavior. I would like it. I would really appreciate it if you would change this particular thing about your behavior. It would make our relationship so much better, you awesome person, you. Okay? Criticism is, the reason you didn't pick up your towel off the bathroom floor is that you're lazy and you don't respect me. So it's a character problem. Now, this thing right here, folks, if we could recognize this going on in all our relationships, the world would be a so much, so much better place, right? Can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't have to walk on eggshells around each other because we knew we could give and receive complaints without blowing up? That's the, when you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around each other, that's when your relationship is in jeopardy. There are churches that are like that all the time where you are so afraid of saying the wrong thing because someone's going to come down on you hard, right? There are situations at work, you are afraid of your coworkers because you have to walk on eggshells around them, or maybe they have to walk on eggshells around you because you can't offer complaints in a trusting environment where you, where you know it's going to be heard. So we've got to learn how to tell the difference between complaint and criticism. And you, you, you start hearing this. I mean, I... I by incorporating this into my life, I begin to see this everywhere. I see it happen at work. I see it happen in churches. I see it happen on Facebook all the time. Right? You are inconsiderate. You're cruel. This is a tendency of yours. This is because of a psychological problem you have, and I'm going to psychoanalyze you and figure out what's wrong with you. Because you are a flawed human being. Your character is broken. You are flawed. It is your sinful nature. Do you hear that religious judgment in there? A complaint about a specific behavior says this, in the context of this great relationship, in the context of my appreciation of you, please be respectful when you talk to me. Please pick up your wet towel when you're done with a shower. Please park your car in such a way that I don't have to move it when I go to work. That was my wife's most recent one to me. And I learn, I park better, don't I? Say, yes. so, <laughs> Just some consideration, right? She's asking for consideration. I'm happy to show my consideration. I think about how much better our world would be if we could do complaints instead of criticism in organizational life and church life. The thing about criticism, it's, it's disempowering. If you're lazy, if you're flawed, there's nothing you can do to change that. It's, that is your state of being. You have a flawed character. You are a failure as a human being. But if it's a complaint, look, it's not you. It's this one behavior. And it may not even be that this behavior is your fault. It may be a system that we, maybe we just fall into some bad habits. And maybe you can help me and I can help you and we can fix it and everything will be better. Right? How much better would our work life be? How much better would things be at work if you could do that? If people could do that with you? Instead of feeling like you were under threat all the time. What if we didn't have to worry about hurt feelings and reprisals because we're all on the same team pulling in the same direction? And if I have a complaint with you, I'm going to do it in such a respectful way that you're going to be delighted to do it for me. Right? Lord, how I wish church could be that way. Can we make it that way? I mean, this is a great thing about starting a new church, folks. We get to put the DNA in the church before we ever get huge and it becomes a problem, all right? I mean, with this, with this small group right here, we can... Make the DNA such that when this is churches 400 people, it's this amazing community of people who love and respect each other and no one has to walk on eggshells. What would our culture be like if we could learn these lessons? I know well-meaning, sincere people on both the left wing and the right wing of the political and theological spectrum. People on the left who believe the big problem with people on the right is their state of being, not their behaviors, their racist bigots, bigots, ignorant about their white or straight or class privilege. It's their state of being that is flawed. There's something wrong with their character, something fundamentally flawed with them as human beings. Yes. Right? 
And the people in the middle are just as bad because they're indecisive or they're inconstant or they're colonizing or they're white supremacist. If you're on the receiving end of that, boom, I'm done with you. Four horsemen of the apocalypse right there. Contempt, criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling. It's not me, it's you. I'm defensive, I'm contemptuous because those lefties are just elitist, commie, pinko sympathizers who are against family and hate America. Right? So I turn the criticism around on them or I stonewall because really, why would you even want to be around someone who does that stuff? Our culture could be so much better if we could recognize these differences. Now, what would it be like if instead of criticism, we learn how to complain? Now, don't get me wrong. You'll never get rid of conflict. I'm not talking about avoiding conflict. That's just as unhealthy. I don't think avoiding conflict would ever be healthy. Every relationship has conflict. Conflict is what happens when you put two people in the same room together. But complaining means we enter into conflict in a way that keeps the future open and makes us part of a team that's working together. So that I've spent too much on time. Let's go on to the next one. Boundaries. We've got to understand boundaries. And this doesn't mean we don't have boundaries, because in the same sermon, Jesus says, don't give what is holy to dogs, don't throw your pigs before swine. Because there are people who have no interest in anything but abuse and exploitation. There are people who will want to hurt you. And you have to have those boundaries and recognize when it's not worth your time. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 16, See, I'm sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so you must be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Jesus means you've got to have boundaries. You've got to know what you're going to do and what you're not going to allow. Doing this re requires a good sense of self, a clear boundary between you and the rest of the world. To be loving, we have to recognize a few things. First, we have to recognize we are not Jesus. It's not our business to save the world. We get to help, but we're not Jesus. We can't fix people. We can't control other people's thoughts or actions. We can't control them. We only own our own thoughts, feelings, and actions. That's all we have control over. Now, I think once we begin with a clear understanding of our own boundaries, then we can become loving and forgiving. Once we realize we can't save other people, we can begin doing the hard work of letting God save us, and we can participate with God in doing justice and helping people who need help. And ironically, once we do that, once we confess that we are not God and we let God be God and salvation belongs to God and not us, we can leave behind the God complex that leads us to think we can fix other people or fix the world. I'm going to bring my white middle class self into your poor situation and help you so I can feel like God. That's done more harm than good. And once I realize I can't even fix my own self, then God opens up the whole world to me and invites me to be a participant in what God is already doing to redeem this, the world. But as long as I'm trying to fix other people, all I'm going to do is alienate them from myself and insert myself between them and God. We also talked about the 8 to 1 ratio. I think that's next. The 8 to 1 ratio. 8 positive interactions to 1 negative one. That means we have to be intentionally about we have to be intentional about practicing thinking good thoughts about other people. Folks, this means you got to pray. Because I, I, really the only way to get to 8 to 1 is to pray for people. To intentionally spend time praying for other people. It's so easy that we don't do it. Five minutes a day. Five minutes in the morning. List the people who are important to you. Think loving thoughts about them. Say one thing to God that you appreciate about them. It transforms your life. It's too easy. If it were harder, we'd be more likely to do it but eight to one. And then when you encounter them, you, you can't help because you've prayed for them. You can't help but be that respectful person because you've already named those good things about them. I want you all to know I pray for you. I'm not going to lie and tell you I pray for you every day, but I pray for you frequently. And I appreciate all of you. I especially appreciate those of you who do stuff for me because it really helps. But no, I appreciate all of you, Right? You guys are an amazing group of talented people. And if I ever convey anything else, I hope you hold me accountable to that. I pray for you. Eight to one. That has to be part of our DNA too. Brain researchers have begun talking about awe as the key to happiness. The importance of just stopping for a moment to do this, what they call meta-reflection. Okay, To take time to say, this right here, this is good. This is what life is about. And when you're sitting there having dinner with somebody, with, when you're sitting in your small groups, when you're praying for each other, whatever you happen to do, just take a moment to go, God, this is what it's all about. It will change your life.
Next, next one. Doing all this stuff helps us build communities of trust. When people learn they can be their authentic selves, that we don't have to walk on eggshells around each other, I've got your back, you can trust me, I can trust you, I'm not going to leave a knife in it. Your back, that is, you know. Uh, that we all together are part on, we're part of the same team, pulling in the same direction, that creates a community of trust. And it's one of those things that has been so hurt in the church, when the church is judgmental or hypocritical or when it casts aspersions on LGBT persons or when it decides it doesn't want people that don't look the same way they do or when they're simply judgmental. Instead of recognizing that we're all broken people, we're all a set of problems. And part of a marriage or a relationship or anything is learning how that those problems become things that we can appreciate about each other because you're different and you have strengths that I don't have. And the only way for us to be a body of Christ is for us all to bring our strengths together and build on them. Jesus Christ says they will know us by our love. What a great invitation. I mean, Jesus' invitation to us is, I want you guys to become expert lovers. No, not that way. I want you guys to become expert lovers, to learn how to love. I'm just asking you to practice love. It's not warm, cozy, touchy, feely kind of stuff. It's work, but it's doable. It's not higher than you can achieve. The bar is set really low. To be a place that models engagement and reconciliation with the world. That's what the church is supposed to be. The kind of love that can turn the other cheek but not be a doormat. A people who are not so afraid of conflict, conflict that we turn a blind eye toward abuse or oppression or injustice, but ha has the back of the people who need it. If we put that into practice, we will know God. If we show people that we can love them and love each other, we will know God in a more intimate way than we've ever known God. So this concludes our series on building relationships better together. I want us to be the kind of church that is better together, that we convey this to the world. For the next few weeks until Easter, we're going to be talking about the DNA of the church because we're still young enough. This is still a new enough church. We're still small enough that we get to set the patterns that will extend into the future, that that create our ministry together. And so we're going to talk about some of our core values, our mission, which you've heard me talk about before. But we're going to set them in the context of what God has done through Jesus Christ and is continuing to do through the resurrection and the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. God's at work inviting us to be a community of trust and love. You guys get to be graduate students of love. May we pray.